Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Greater Naples. My name is Tony Fisher. I am so grateful to serve this congregation as your minister. Uh, welcome you here this morning, welcoming those who are online uh, watching this morning, and all of you great people out on the pavilion. It's great to see you out there. A few waves. Good. Good. They're tuned in. Welcome, and um, as always, uh, I am just grateful for your presence, all of you, and also for those folks who help make this service possible our ushers, our office administrator, Ana Riazzi, our AV tech, Daniel Goodset, and tech chair, John Forsyth, uh, Abby and Sean Allison, who are our musical co-chairs, or our co-music director's chairs, something like that. <laughs> uh, it's great to have the choir with us this morning. You will find that it's great also. Uh, I warn those of you out on, uh, the ether, in the ether that the volume on the choir we're not quite sure of quite yet, so bear with us with that. But they're going to sound glorious, so if you were here, <laughs> then you would hear. <laughs> uh, we're also uh, very excited to have our musical guest, Nathaniel. Cornell with us this morning. Nathaniel, as some of you know, grew up in this congregation. Well, he actually grew up in Naples and went to school here, but grew up in this congregation, uh, son of uh, Brad and Martha Cornell. Uh, he's, since, since being here, Nathaniel has studied at Oberlin Conservatory and the University of Michigan. Uh, he's currently playing for the Lansing Symphony Orchestra, and if you're uh, downtown Naples, uh, Lately, he's also currently playing for the Naples Philharmonic uh, this month. Um, but he's also served as concertmaster uh, on the National Orchestral Institute, uh, principal second violin of Siena Music Festival in Siena, Italy, and concertmaster at Opera in the Ozark. So we're just so grateful to have Nathaniel with us and playing once again this morning. Uh, the choir is here, so uh, it's just my love to you and my gratitude for you. And... Um, would like to call out one of its members who has some words to share with us this morning. Ann Fullerton, who has been a member of this congregation, was a member of, of my search committee that brought me here. So again, I have a, a wonderful gratitude for that. But Anne uh, has some things she'd like to share with us this morning. Oops. Good morning. Um, I am so pleased to be here and to share my thoughts with you today. I am calling this little talk to you, my seeds of grace. Tony's one of my seeds of grace. Um, however, I didn't enter Unitarianism gracefully. I was a high school junior and very active member of my local MYF, a Methodist Youth Fellowship. We had just concluded a weekend gathering where a couple of missionaries were asking us to help them raise money to go back and and return more and convert more people to our faith. I listened and I thought, why do those people have to change their beliefs? They have lived in peace and harmony within their community, believing the way they believe for years and decades, respecting nature and each other. So I spoke up. Res uh oh, is right. That didn't have a happy ending respecting and asking the very question that I was thinking. I was immediately reprimanded by our minister. He said, who's influencing you? And where are you picking up these ideas? These are ridiculous. Well, I left that meeting feeling disgraced and feeling very, very bad. By the time I got home, the minister had already reached out to my mother. Of course, she was furious, and I was infuriated. My father was a bit more open to my searching beliefs. But he said, Anne Margaret, if you're going to go this route, you better get some facts behind what you're thinking. And he said, and then carry on as you want. Well, I could never return to that church. So the next Sunday, I took the bus downtown Detroit 
with a friend and attended my first UU congregation in downtown Detroit. Reverend Pullman was, Dr. Pullman was our minister. That morning changed my life. I was surrounded by interesting people and I heard ideas that I was just starting to formulate and speak out loud. What joy! And the music, they had a harpsichord. <laughs> After I married, my husband and young son and I moved from Detroit to a small town in Upper Peninsula of Michigan. A friend and I started a UU fellowship as there was no UU congregation for at least 100 miles in any direction. I was living in Garrison Keeler territory. <laughs> On a Prairie Home Companion, Garrison often told jokes about UUs, like the church of what's happening now. Very disrespectful. At first, I didn't stand up to my friends who were also helping make those comments. And then I finally had had enough. And I stood up loud and proud and carefully explained what I believed in and why I felt that way. It's hard to dismiss our principles without you sounding ridiculous. That feeling of pride ha that enabled me to stand up for my beliefs has sustained me through many of my life's disappointments and successes. The seeds of grace that I acknowledged helped me through the pandemic, calls from you use in this congregation, I call them seeds of grace, meeting on the outside of the pavilion and masked and ready to go to work on any issue. I call that a seed of grace. Donating to weekend meals and Christmas tree giving, a seed of grace. So here I am. I've been a member of this congregation 23 years. I've lost many dear friends over the years, but I've also gained so much from every one of you. Interesting life stories, talents, and experiences. I have wonderful memories of events, music, and worship. I am here because of you. And I know that many of you say this congregation is, is my family. Well, it's my family too. And I agree that this is a very important place to be once a week to get filled up again and get our soul back in place. Every day in many ways, <clears throat> excuse me, some or all or even just one of you gives me pause to realize how grateful I am to be in this community. You make a difference to so many people. Please join me in supporting this congregation with your time, your gift, and your treasure. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Ann, and, and, and uh, I mentioned everybody else that's involved in the service, and last but, but not least, there's Patty Bryan, our worship associate this morning. Thank you. Good morning. We are so glad that you've joined us, whether you're here in the sanctuary or out on the pavilion or watching us on Facebook Live at home or sitting sometime in the future watching us on Facebook Live or YouTube. If you're new to the congregation, and we're especially, especially grateful that you found us, our hope is to make you feel welcome and help you to find ways to connect. Our mission statement reads, the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Greater Naples is a welcoming congregation, freely seeking intellectual and spiritual growth. We strive to create a larger community of peace, justice, and love. Here, we learn and grow together and try to live our values out in public. If you found us online for the first time, we hope that you will email our administrator at office at uunaples.org. That way, we can include you in our regular email news blasts and let you know about all the upcoming learning and fellowship opportunities right here at UUCGN. 
Our service theme this morning is opening to joy and wonder. And we consider this in between time as the days grow short and our attention begins to shift forward in anticipation of the new year. In the Christian calendar, it is the season of Advent, a time of anticipation, of waiting, and preparing. A few years ago, Pope Francis made it clear that the anticipation that uh, Christians should be feeling should not necessarily be for our good news from afar, but for the rebirth of love and service within. He says, Advent invites us to a commitment to vigilance, looking beyond ourselves, expanding our minds and hearts in order to open ourselves up to the needs of people, of brothers and sisters, and to the desire of a new world. In a time of uncertainty, which this certainly is, when we're all holding on to the hope that will soon emerge fully from the darkness of a worldwide pandemic, where will we look for the good news? Now, let's settle ourselves into this time of worship with the morning's prelude.
right, so how, how do you follow that? I mean, <laughs> come into this place of peace and let it silence, heal your spirit. Come into this place of memory and let its history warm your soul. Come into this place of prophecy and power and let its vision change your heart. As Patty lights our chalice this morning, join me in the chalice lighting response that you'll see on the screen. We come together once again, knowing we are not isolated beings, but connected in mystery and miracle to the universe, to this community, and to each other. And let's join Sean and Abby as they lead us in our first of three Advent hymns this morning. People look east, rise as you are willing or able to do. People look east, the time is near of the crowning of the year. Make your heart fair as you are able to your hearth and set the table. People look east and sing today. Crowned guest is on the way. For us the God through earth is bare. One more seed is planted there. Give up your strength, the seed to nourish that in the feller may flourish. People look east and sing today. Love the roses on the way. Stars keep them watch when night is dim. One more light the bowl shall brim. Shining beyond the frosty weather. Bright as sun and moon together. People look east and sing today. Love the star is on the way. So it's the season of Advent, as Patty mentioned uh, at the beginning. And so how would any good Unitarian Universalist minister uh, start a service uh, during Advent season? By offering a Hindu creation story. <laughs> so the Hindu religion is, is you know, very diverse and multifaceted as any in the world, really but primarily holds up to the cyclical nature uh, of the universe. And while there are many gods, uh, many, many gods, uh, there is the uh, prime triumvirate, the trimurti of uh, Brahma, who's responsible for the creation of all things, and then Vishnu, who serves as the preserver of the universe, and then finally there's Shiva, who, among other things, uh, is the god of destruction, so that, in fact, creation pe can begin once again and the cycle move forward. In the very beginning of time, there, human beings also were divine entities um, endowed with the secret of life, but soon had lost their way, which is the basis for this story. Now, when human beings began to thrive in the world, turning their focus on acquisition and organ organization of things and, of course, of each other, creating language, building villages, hunting and planting and harvesting their food, being engrossed in their busyness, the gods became concerned that they had perhaps made these creatures a bit too dedicated to things rather than to being. So they decided they needed to take away that spark of divinity and the secret of life and hide it away so that human beings would not find it. But they had to figure out where they might put that secret to life. One minor god suggested that they put it at the bottom of the earth's deepest abyss. And another suggested that, no, maybe the top of the highest, snowiest mountain in the world. That would be where they should put it. But another god said, no, 
human beings will find those things. We should put it on the far side of the moon. They'll never get it there. The Supreme Brahma listened to all of this conversation and recognized that the gods had indeed become afraid of these human beings and their intelligence and their drive. And he thought about it for a while and he said, no, no, we will hide the secret of life, the secret to joy and wonder, right back where we found it, in the hearts of those humans They'll never look there. (laughs) And all the gods nodded at the wisdom of Brahma and said, that would be wonderful, and so it was, and so it is. And since then, human beings have been climbing up great mountains and diving into the earth and going to the far side of the moon, exploring, searching for something that rests right here in the heart. So, where were we? (laughs) Advent. Oh, Advent. That's right. Our centering hymn this morning, uh, Let Christmas Come, was written by a Unitarian Universalist minister, John Hanley Morgan, who served congregations in the United States and in Canada. And the poem, his poem, talks about truth and love and anticipation of love in such a powerful way. The poem was set to a tune by Ralph Vaughan Williams, which itself ends in anticipation without fully resolving the final chord. So let's remain seated and join Abby and Sean in Let Christmas Come. Christmas come, each story told, when days are short and winds are cold, let Christmas come, its lovely song, when evening soon and night is long, let Christmas come, its great star glow, on quiet city parks of snow, let Christmas come, its tables lean, love born again, the truth of dream. As we approach this season, we recognize that so many of us come to this time of year on any given year with a bit of trepidation and anxiety. Some, of course, with great joy and exuberance. And we honor all approaches to the season, to the holiday. But again, recognizing that this is a season when we remember many things, including our losses. On this third Sunday of Advent, we recognize that within this room there are wonderful leaping hearts and hearts that are sad. Holding memories, holding people who, for which we have concern. And so, as I offer my hand across the room. I hope that you will speak a name. It could be your own. It could be someone you're thinking about, either in joy or sorrow. And we'll share those names out loud. And I hope uh, for those of you who are with us online that you will speak that name, vibrating your chest with that name, bringing that name into presence. Joys and sorrows.
Thank you. And we light this candle of community for all those whose joys, whose sorrows remain unspoken. Please join me in the spirit of meditation. We await the moment of magic, when the whole round earth turns again toward the sun. We await the moment of magic when people beaten down and broken with nothing left but misery and candles and their own clear voices kindle tiny lights and whisper sacred music. And here's a blessing. The dark universe is suddenly illuminated by the lights of the menorah, suddenly ablaze with the lights of the canara, softly bathed in the glow from the advent candles, and the whole world is glad and loud with winter singing. We await the moment of magic when an eastern star beckons the ignorant toward an unknown goal. And here's a blessing. They find nothing in the end but an ordinary baby, born at midnight, born in poverty. And the baby's cry, like bells ringing, makes people wonder as they wander through their lives what human love might really look like. We await the moment of magic. And here's a blessing. We already possess all the gifts we need. We've already received our presence, ears to hear the music, eyes to behold the lights, hands to build true peace on earth, and to hold each other close and tight. Share some silence together.
We have two readings today. <clears throat> the first is by Vaclav Havel. Uh, he was a remarkable, multi-talented Czech writer, playwright, and dissident. In 1979, he was sentenced to four and a half years in prison for his fight for freedom. In 1989, he helped to found the Civic Forum, an opposition movement, and he was elected president of Czechoslovakia in 1994. And this was the exciting part. He became the first president of the independent Czech Republic. The first reading is from Dis uh, Disturbing the Peace by Václav Havel. He writes, I should probably say first that the kind of hope I often think about, especially in situations that are particularly hopeless, such as prison, I understand above all as a state of mind. Hope is not a state of the world. Either we have hope within us, or we don't. It's a dimension of the soul, and it's not essentially dependent on some particular observation of the world or estimate of the situation. Hope is not prognostication. It's an orientation of the spirit, an orientation of the heart. I don't think you can explain it as a mere derivative of something here, of some movement, or some favorable signs in the world. I feel that its deepest roots are in the transcendental. Although I can't, unlike Christians, for example, say anything concrete about the transcendental. Hope, in this deep and powerful sense, is not the same as a joy that things are going well, or a willingness to invest in enterprises that are obviously headed for early success, but rather an ability to work for something that is because it's good, not just because it stands a chance of success. Hope is definitely not the same thing as optimism. It's not a conviction that something will turn out well, but the certainty that something makes sense, regardless of how it turns out. The second reading is by Leslie Ayuva Fales, the pastor of the UU Fellowship of Fairbanks, Alaska. I had a terrible time with uh, Ahuva. Uh, I had to look it up and ask Google to pronounce it for me. And I didn't do a very good job. <clears throat> she writes, All that we have been separately and all that we will become together is stretched out before and behind us like stars scattered across the canvas of the sky. And we stand at the precipice, arms locked together like tandem skydivers, working up the courage to jump. Tell me, friends, what have we got to lose? Our fear of failure? Our mistrust of our own talents? What have we got to lose? A poverty of the spirit? The lie that we are alone? What wonders await us in the space between the first leap and the moment that our feet, our wheels, however we move our bodies across this precious earth, touch down softly on unknown soil? What have we got to lose that we can't replace with some previously unimaginable joy? Oh, 
morning opens wide before us like a door into the light just beyond the day lies waiting ready to throw off the night and we stand upon its threshold points to turn and take its flight now the earth in all its glory springs to meet the rising sun warms to all who walk upon it cradling all that will be done all our labor all our loving mingle and become as one This is the third Sunday of Advent in the Christian liturgical calendar, Gaudet Sunday. Gaudet meaning being the Latin word for rejoice. And while it's not been a tradition here at the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Greater Naples, there are many Unitarian Universalist congregations around the country that will light the Advent candle on this morning as they have the past two and the next one, the four Sundays before Christmas. The candle of joy is lit in anticipation of the joy of unity, of salvation, often a different color. But this third Sunday, uh, expressing the idea of joy sometimes doesn't feel quite right in, in any normal year, given the tensions of the season the anxieties that some, it brings to some, the particular ache that many of us feel during this time, a mixture of that longing and loneliness, a kind of homesickness for some place that maybe we've never even been. But in this year, in a year when there's been so much darkness in the world, when we've all been waiting, waiting for an end to a pandemic, waiting for a world to turn towards justice, waiting for these difficult days of isolation and sorrow to be over. Continues to be an even stranger time. And I have the sense that even, or instead of waiting for good news, waiting for the good news to come, whether internally or from afar, we seem to be in a constant state of flinch, waiting not for just another shoe to drop, but for a whole closet of shoes <laughs> to drop. I have a friend who is a perennial model of this way of thinking, a pattern that more than a few of us have slipped into. He's someone who's skeptical about joy rarely letting himself get carried away with the emotion. His is a scarcity mentality, life a zero-sum game. If something good happens, he's looking for around to see from where the corresponding disaster will come. Joy may begin to bubble up, but his immediate response is to hold it in check, fearing that if he lets it go too far, it will only lead down the road to disappointment, or worse, that he'll be inviting some calamity. And while I know that many of us remain a little more hopeful than my friend, we have, as my colleague, the Reverend Julia Hamilton has put it, become overwhelmed and underjoyed. And so where does joy fit into this season, this time 
in our history. The stories and the songs that have been told and retold across the generations hold a key, giving us a way to see that, yes, joy will come, mostly unbidden, but always within the context of our real and often difficult lives. The stories of the season and the songs remind us that joy can still find us, any one of us, but it usually comes right alongside the day-to-day struggle. Joy and woe are woven fine, the poet William Blake wrote. And spiritual writer Mark Nepo agrees, suggesting that joy is the transformation of our suffering, not the escape from all that we have to face. It was certainly some of the old songs and a lot of camaraderie that brought many of us joy this past wonderful Wednesday evening as more than 70 people joined together on the pavilion to sing Christmas songs and enjoy the music of the season. There was, I know, because I felt it, a joy bubbling up unexpectedly. Our lack of community has been a real loss to us. And in the joy of returning on Sundays or on committee meetings or chalice circles on the pavilion or on a wonderful Wednesday, that joy has been palpable in our coming together. And what did we do to make it happen? We showed up open to a degree, and willing, and hopeful. And it seems that this is one of the two critical elements of being open to joy, this moving intentionally into direct relationship with one another and the world. Being present. More important, being in the moment. Without trying to box that moment up or rate it for experience online or while you're right and still in the middle of it, if you can do that and be in the moment, then you can be there when joy shows up. Of course, the other side of that coin is the other critical element to being open to joy is being open to sorrow and pain, the reality of each other's pain. But that's what community is all about. This does require some spiritual fortitude. The time, the work, the effort to look within, to find the secret of life at the center. Creating an attitude, perhaps, of hope. This is Vaclav Havel was talking about not an optimism that things are going to be perfect, but an understanding that moving with intention into community is the right thing to do and bears wonderful fruit. The Reverend Libby Smith, the long, lifelong Unitarian Universalist minister uh, serving in Lower Bucks, Pennsylvania, tells about her father who had a poster on his study wall when she was growing up. And it said on the poster, it's better to travel hopefully than to arrive. (laughs) And Libby never understood it, and actually the poster frustrated her as a child. The only explanation she could come up with was that the idea that sometimes the reality of what you wait for doesn't match your expectations. So anticipation turns out to be better than getting there. But it didn't seem actually to be right, so she never actually spoke up about this to her father. But perhaps, she realized later on, that the poster meant something quite different. It's better to travel hopefully than to arrive because hopefulness, that ability to imbue one's life with meaning and value even in the face of terrible odds, hopefulness exists independent of one's destination. Living a life dedicated to the pursuit of truth 
knowing that it's the right thing, must be a hopeful one. The author Annie Dillard has a great story as well about her childhood. She, when she was six or seven years old, she says she used to go around Pittsburgh uh, taking her own precious pennies and placing them here and there in the neighborhood, hiding the penny along some stretch of sidewalk and, and grass. She had put it in the roots of a sycamore tree, perhaps. At some point, she started drawing little arrows in chalk towards the pennies that she left out there. Surprise ahead. Money this way. She was always greatly excited about that, but she didn't stay around to watch what happened. She would let it be. Reflecting again back on this experience as an adult, she says... The world is fairly strewn and studded with pennies, cast broadside from a generous hand. But, and this is the point, she says, who gets excited by a mere penny? Is it dire poverty indeed when a man can be so malnourished and fatigued that he won't stoop to pick up a penny? But if you cultivate a healthy poverty and simplicity so that finding a penny will literally make your day, then since the world is, in fact, is planted with numerous pennies, your days will indeed be made. Think about that phrase, make my day or make your day. the small, little, penny-sized opportunities that each one of us has to make somebody else's day. A kind word, a generous hand, simple, simple things. Living a life with hope and expressing that hope through generosity brings joy. Let me close with these words that I found unattributed. It's easy to get tricked, taken for a ride, convinced that joy is a possession, something to be open just by us as if it's a holiday special delivery, waiting for us to unwrap it and keep. And who can blame us with pain being so prevalent sadness seeming to stay around. But maybe joy is elusive for a reason. Maybe it's slippery in order to help us understand that it, it was put here to fly, or better yet, to be flung, to be passed, not possessed, to be spread between you and me, between the ones who received its gift and the ones who have been looking for its treasure for a very long time. Maybe it's a beautiful and elegant contagion over which we have more control than we think. If only we share it. If only we notice that joy is not ours to keep, but ours to give. Maybe joy opens us as much as we open to it. Maybe that's the way light leaks into the world. So may it be. So as we take this time to consider this wonderful service of music and ideas, let's also take the time to show our gratitude for this incredible congregation that, and all that it does. The morning's offering will be gratefully received. And I remind you again that online that the, the choir volume may not be quite right, but we hope it is. And... Uh, I hope you enjoy.
Whoa, I thought I was going to have to be surgically removed from this thing. <laughs> I, now, our congregational life. These few moments are dedicated to major announcements or information about upcoming all-congregational events. Everything you need to know about the ongoing activities right here at UUCGN. You can find in our Sunday news, the weekly news email, or by going online to our website at uunaples.org. This week, we hope that you'll be able to join us in some of these activities. Today, in Thomas Hall, following the service at about 11.20, uh, Reverend Tony Fisher and the membership committee will hold a newcomer orientation. If you'd like to know a little bit more about Unitarian Universalism and about this congregation, this is your chance. 
For anyone interested in membership in our wonderful community, attending an orientation is a must. And next Sunday's service will be our Jazz and Justice Lessons and Carols, featuring the words of prophetic women and men from across the years, accompanied by carols and seasonal music with a little bit of syncopation. <laughs> This will be a service for all ages. The next Mindful Monday Forum is coming up a week from tomorrow, Monday, December 20th, when the speaker will be pollster Mark Schulman, who will be talking about Americans sizing up President Biden's first year in office. And, and you are invited to our annual candlelight Christmas Eve service, 6 o'clock p.m., right here in the sanctuary, featuring traditional readings and wonderful music from our guest soprano, Nadia Marshall, the UUCGN choir, and of course, Abby and Sean Allison. This service will not be streamed, so that's six o'clock on Christmas Eve. So you, you gotta get here. More information about all these offerings can be found in our e-news blasts or in our monthly newsletter. And now, let's rise in body or spirit and sing our closing hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. The words will be on the screen. So let yourself fall open to Advent, to anticipation, to hope, 
to the belief that what is empty will be filled, that what is broken will be repaired, and what is lost can always be found, no matter how many times it is lost. Go in love, go in peace, go in hope, and have a wonderful day.